really happy to see that quite a few people have already touched on the topic of closures without giving too much avoid, uh, away. So Dimitri brought it up this morning as saying it's, it's really a core part of, of knowing JavaScript. So hopefully I can enlighten you a bit more about what exactly closures are, clear up some misunderstandings at the same time. And we're going to learn about closures by looking at something called an uh, immediately invoked function expression. There's a little bit about me. That was a pretty good intro, so I can just move on. Um, immediately invoked function expressions, um, also known as iffies. It's a, the term was coined by Ben Orman uh, a couple of years ago, and this is what they look like. You might have seen these before, maybe not. It's, it's a little bit cryptic if you've never seen one before. Um, generally, the, the code goes in the middle there, and that's just a wrapper around, around it. What does that mean exactly? Well, immediately invoked, uh, obviously, it means that this function is invoked immediately. Um, this, this expression is called once and never run again, unlike a typical function would. So the brackets here at the end call the function. What is, what is a function expression? Well, there's uh, two ways of defining functions in JavaScript. The, the first one here is probably the one we, it's, you, know, you learn day one in JavaScript, which is function, foo, and there, there's your function body right there. The other way that you, you le learn possibly quite a bit later is when you really start to discover the uh, first class nature of functions in JavaScript where they can be passed around like variables and assigned. And um, here's an example of, of creating an, an anonymous function and assigning it to foo. And this is a function expression. So you might ask why is the difference really important in this context especially? Well, you can't immediately invoke uh, a function declaration like this. So this is not valid syntax. This, however, is. And uh, the, the important difference here is you've got some parentheses around the function that causes the parser to treat it not as a function declaration, but as a uh, definition. So do you, do you always need the parentheses? Uh, like I just said, basically, you don't need them if it's already an expression. However, the preferred syntax is to wrap it uh, so that other people reading your code get a heads up that this is an iffy and not a regular function. Um, you can imagine that this function here, even though it's immediately invoked, if this was a 20 line function and someone else wrote it and you're reading it, it's a bit of a surprise at the end when it suddenly invokes itself like that. Um, so it's a nice heads up to people reading your code. They go, right, this is not a regular function. Parentheses is not the only way to do it. It seems to be the, the standard way that people do it. All of these work as well, um, but I would recommend sticking with parentheses. You see these in, in the wild quite a bit. First and last lines of jQuery source right here. You'll see the whole thing is wrapped in an iffy. It passes a reference of window up as a parameter, um, which can be useful in, in minification, that sort of thing. And an interesting thing to note that they do here is that they pass uh, that they've got a parameter here called undefined, which is undefined. Uh, and they do that because in ECMAScript 3, uh, undefined can actually be changed. Um, if you've got a script in your page, can say undefined equals true. It's totally valid to do that. That's fixed um, in ECMAScript 5, but interesting little thing to know. Uh, jQuery plugins also use the same pattern, and they tend to uh, they pass jQuery, the global jQuery variable in, and then alias it as dollar. The reason they do this is because uh, jQuery um, can run in no conflict mode. Uh, if, you, if you've got, say, a legacy page that's got jQuery and prototype running side by side, and maybe prototype was used first, jQuery was brought in later, um, prototype already was using the dollar sign, so you might uh, use jQuery in no conflict mode. This allows the jQuery plugin to work um, in, in any case. Um, Backbone JS is wrapped in an iffy. It uses a slightly different syntax here where it actually uh, runs dot call with this passed as the context, which essentially is the same thing. And CoffeeScript, uh, any, anything that you write with CoffeeScript when compiled uh, with the default settings is wrapped in an iffy, uh, just like you saw with Backbone. Um, another interesting case as well is request animation frame. A lot of people tend to put in an iffy like this. so. You, in this case, the, it's not an anonymous function. Now we have uh, a named function expression called anim loop. So it can reference itself inside the function when, uh, when passing it to the request animation frame API um, before calling your render function. 
So th there's, there's a few different uses for it, and I'm going to cover them off. The first one, which we've kind of already touched on, is um, using it as a way to uh, protect unwanted uh, globals from, from leaking out of your, of, of your code. So here you've got a library, lib.js, and, and um, you've got a private variable here called bar, and that doesn't go into the global scope because it's scoped to this function. If you do want a variable to go out and be publicly available, you attach it to a global object like window, um, which is uh, what libraries like jQuery do. So now in, in your script JS, you can access public, but you can't access private. Uh, the if is are useful if you want to compute and return a, a value in one statement. Um, it sometimes you only have space for one statement, such as when you're, uh, you, you've got an object literal like this. So if you wanted to create an object here called browser with a, a property called vendor prefix, it might take a little bit of logic to figure out what the vendor prefix is. Um, but you only need to do that once on page load and then never again. So you can chuck that in an iffy, um, declare a variable snipped out there but there's be some logic there to work out the vendor prefix, and then you can return it. So now anything that's returned from this iffy um, gets assigned as the value of this, of this whole statement. It goes into vendor prefix in this case. Um, it's this same style of, of syntax that helps when you're creating a JavaScript class uh, in one statement. So uh, a class typically would take at least two statements. You'd want your constructor, and you probably want to attach something to the prototype. So here we've got uh, our constructor. We've assigned um, an object literal to the prototype, and now we're returning it. So in one outer statement, we've um, been able to do a little bit of work under the hood and then return the value. CoffeeScript, um, for those of you who hate curly braces and semicolons, um, does this for you. So when you write a, a class foo in CoffeeScript, this one line um, compiles to this, where it's actually creating an iffy, attaching some things to it, and then returning the value at the end. Um, this, uh, and this allows it to do a lot of complex things within that iffy. Um, it can do inheritance and um, that sort of thing. Uh, this is not something I'd recommend, but it's a, it's a fun little um, exercise, which is that you can emulate block scope in older browsers by putting an iffy in the middle of your for loop. Um, so typically, i is scoped to the it's scoped to the outer function that contains the uh, the for loop. So the value is shared throughout the ho the whole um, through every instance of that loop. So uh, by putting an iffy like this, what you're what you're doing is you're creating a new scope um, in line within that block. And now all the variables, including i, because it's been passed in um, as a parameter, it locks in the value at that moment in time, and it allows this to work. So here we're attaching a click handler to an element. Um, obviously, we're going to do it three times. So when you click that element, you're going to get three alerts, one, two, three. If you drop the iffy and you just go back to your normal lexical scope or without your emulated block scope, um, that, like I was saying, that value of i is shared um, in the outer function. So um, at the time that you click that element, it's going to inspect the value of i at that moment in time, not the value it was when it was uh, created. So what you end up is 444 popping up. Um, there's ways to get around that, which we'll come back to later. Um, CopyScript as well has, a, has do, which basically creates an iffy on the fly. So if you ever need it, there's a nice shortcut for that. Uh, JavaScript doesn't have... Uh, the concept of public and private variables, but you can uh, have the same effect with, with ifies in this case, where um, we've got number resolves to an object that has an add and a get function, and both of those reference a uh, num variable, which you can't access globally, um, you can't modify it directly, you can only modify it via these add and get functions, which operate on it. Um, this is uh, also available with with functions uh, because you've got first class functions. Here you've um, it's a pretty contrived example, but you've got foo, which ends up being a reference to this public function. And um, due to this is where closures come in. Due to uh, closures, you can actually uh, public the function has access to the private function, even though it might not uh, be in the same scope as foo when it's finally returned. Because um, this function comes out of this other function. Um, 
So just to clear things up, first of all, a lot, a, a lot of people I hear think that iffies are closures, um, and that's, that's not true. So you might ask, what exactly is a closure? Um, a closure is created, like it says, when a function is returned from another function. Um, but the important part is that uh, the function that's been returned retains its original scope. Um, and it, it's, it's expected behavior. Um, it, uh, quite a lot of people sort of stumble across closures and then only later find out what they're called um, because it, they just kind of make sense when you need them. Um, here we've got foo is um, similar to our last example. It ends up being this function. And when this function is returned, um, you can call it and it'll return the, val the value of this variable. But that variable is hidden away in a different scope which is not available in the global scope. Um, this is a closure. So closures um, are useful to fix the lack of block scope for event handlers like we saw earlier. Um, so the, the, the best approach, better than putting an iffy in the middle of your for loop, is to have a function that creates the function and you pass it the, uh, the value of i. And that'll seal in the value at the point when this make alert function is run. So now this will work correctly, a lot easier to read, um, and you get to use closures, which is pretty cool. So uh, one thing I think is important to touch on as well, especially if you're reading um, older stuff online, is that they, they used to be called self-executing anonymous functions. Um, I've been guilty of calling them this in the past as well. And I think it's important to note that um, they are now the, the name's been changed for an important reason. So why is it incorrect? Uh, if these don't execute themselves, you just run them like a normal function. Um, and they don't have to be anonymous. As we saw with the request animation frame example, they can be named function expressions. Um, and they'll still, it's still the same concept. Uh, here's a real self-executing anonymous function. I've never seen this in real life, but here you go. That's what it would actually look like. Uh, and it's calling itself with arguments.callE. And um, this if block here, uh, this is just to check that if the function's calling itself, we'll bail out. Otherwise, it'll just recursively run until you run out of memory. So interesting thing is to note here is that um, arguments.callE is deprecated in ECMAScript 5. The, um, the preferred way of writing this now is to name your function expression. Again, similar to the um, request animation frame example. Now, typically, these two would be the same name, but I've kept them separate so you can follow what's, what's happening here. Um, in the function bar, it can refer to itself now as bar. And if, um, if that bar wasn't right there, then you wouldn't be able to reference it in ECMAScript 5 um, strict mode. So now we can, and you'll see now it's actually a lot more readable than having arguments.callE everywhere as well. That's a bonus. So wrapping up, uh, why are ifies useful? Um, they're really good for sealing in your code uh, in, in self-contained scopes and, and preventing uh, global variables from leaking out. This is really important if you're writing um, code that's for other people to use. You'll find most um, major libraries, uh, well, I'd say all major libraries tend to wrap their code in iffy like this. Um, they're really handy for being able to compute values on the fly where only one statement is allowed, like object literals. Um, and they're really good for sealing up classes into one statement. Um, and it, it helps for maintainability when people are reading your code. It's a lot easier to follow. Um, if you're writing a compiler like JavaScript, uh, like, sorry, CoffeeScript, then you, you might want to know about how to emulate block, script, uh, block scope. Sorry. But um, in ECMAScript 6, we're getting the uh, let keyword, which gives you block scope at the same time, which is kind of confusing, but there you go. And um, they're useful in creating private functions, private variables, um, using closures. So that's it. Um, slides are available online at bit.ly slash getenclosure. Um, if you had any questions, feel free to come up to me um, during or after the event. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Thanks.